Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the Music Declares Emergency Canada launch, so it's a, an exciting day for all of us here. Today we're celebrating uh, the introduction to this Canadian chapter of Music Declares Emergency, and together we aim to light inner fires, empower action, and inspire change in all of us. The speakers will highlight some incredible initiatives that are currently underway, review the political discourse in Canada, shed light on what is ahead of us, and on how folks in the music industry can get involved. As we gather together, each in our own little corner, let us remember that we are on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. As a community, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live, learn, play, and work. Today, we acknowledge that this virtual event is officially being hosted in Takaranto on Treaty 13 territory, also known as Toronto. This is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee Confe Confederacy, and the Wendat. My name is Liv Cazola, and I am a Guelph, Ontario-based musician. I'm a part of two musical projects, Tragedy Anne and The Lifers, and I'm also a passionate music educator and advocate for the earth. Today, you're going to be hearing some amazing speakers that we're fortunate to have with us. Faye Milton, the founder of Music Declares Emergency. Uh, soon to be joining us will be Laurence Lafond Beau of Soft Fabric, Milk and Bone, and the co-founder of ACT Movement. Bridget Fry of Moscow Apartment, representing Climate Live Canada. Catherine Abreu of Climate Action Network Canada. And Caroline Brooks of The Good Lovelies and a fellow Music Declares Canada working group member. Hi everyone, so I'm a co-founder of Music Declares Emergency in the UK, which was the first Music Declares Emergency group. Um, I'm also a musician, I played drums in a band called Savages. We've toured across Canada right the way through from east to west at some point. Um, and yes, so we formed in 2019, um, two years ago now nearly, and it started coming from the um, huge climate protests there were in the UK, in, specifically in London during that time, that was the big Extinction Rebellion protest. And that brought together a lot of people. It brought a lot of people out of the woodwork who'd felt very isolated and very, um, we well, yeah, isolated really thinking that they were worrying about climate, but they didn't know who their peers were and who else was thinking about it. So it brought a lot of people together and it brought a lot of us from the music industry together and we found ourselves bumping into each other on the streets or linking up through various different um di various different ways so we decided to form a group called music declares emergency there was already a group called culture declares emergency and um they had launched with the tate modern and lots of art institutions on board to declare a climate and ecological emergency so we thought okay Culture is amazing, but music, we've got big egos in music. We need to have our own group and to sort of take things on in our own way as well. So we launched Music Declares Emergency. We, are, we decided to be separate from Extinction Rebellion because that's very off-putting for some people, very divisive. So we decided to go our, our own way on that, although we obviously support each other's aims. And yeah, it's been running since then, really. We launched our No Music on a Dead Planet campaign, which I'm wearing on the t-shirts now, um, which has been really successful so far. And really what we found is that um, when we launched, there was a huge, huge will within the industry to make this happen. Just connections were happening left, right and centre. It felt like the energy was already there. So everyone was just waiting for someone to do it. So we've just had this incredible um, sort of support from the industry. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know about our 
who we've had to sign up, but we've had all the major labels in, in the UK and loads of the indie labels, institutions like the Musicians Union, um, huge sort of touring companies, etc. And yeah, amazing musicians internationally, people like Billie Eilish and more closer to home, Radiohead, um, more musicians than I can ever remember to say, but all the way through to the grassroots, which is equally as important. Um, and forms a huge base of uh, our people who are involved in what we do. Uh, MDE Canada was built on conversations coming out of the climate strike in 2019, as well as the Wet'suwet'en uh, Solidarity fundraising events in early 2020. Um, a group of us were interested in moving the climate justice agenda forward in the Canadian music industry specifically, and we were beginning discussion at reach just as COVID hit, and here we are exactly a year later, finally. <laughs> and there's a, there's a small group of us, and um, we have come together to organize and launch MDE Canada. It's a great honor. Um, for us, MDE Canada has four arms, so I like thinking about them as arms. And uh, we're trying to gather all these arms in. Um, the first is through political work that is leveraging artists to mobilize their audiences. Artists have a lot of power and um, I have seen really amazing conversations come out of even just talking about something simple as tree planting, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, our second arm is through changing the music industry through individual practices, obviously, but especially organizational level work. Like I think we can all agree that um, musicians take on a lot and artists take on a lot, and it's really time for industry to step forward. I'm really happy to hear, Faye, that your major labels are all on side. We have yet in Canada to get a single label on board, so we are we are gunning for that big time. Um, our third arm is being inspired to create music and art that discusses and addresses the climate emergency. So whether that's through um, songwriting, um, we're in conversations with the Songwriters Association of Canada to you know host these songwriting events that that focus on climate, focus on the environment. And then, most importantly, rooted uh, where we are rooted is a solidarity with communities that are experiencing environmental racism. So we recognize that BIPOC communities are bearing the brunt of this uh, climate nightmare, frankly. So we are, are keeping that uh, at the center of all of our discussions um, as we move forward. Um, you can probably sense I'm about to ask you something. So uh, we are super grassroots, capital G grassroots, and we're at the very beginning stages of our organizations and we are open to collaboration. Um, at this point we're operating with no funding and we are 100% volunteer driven. So we are actively looking for collaborators to join our committee, our working group, to help us develop other working groups depending on your, your experience and your expertise, uh, to help us organize events, to support arms like orgs like Climate Live that Bridget's going to talk about um, soon. Basically, we're looking to move the climate justice conversation forward across the industry, across the country, um, bottom up, up, down, all around. Over the last decade and a half, we have uh, tried to make big changes internally to our operations um, to reduce our impact on the environment. So um, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we all recognize the significant footprint of touring uh, on a, from a climate change perspective. And that weighs on me pretty heavy as a touring artist and as a mama, mama artist as well. Um, but it all started for us uh, 10 years ago when we started uh, working on water justice issues. So in Canada, we have a really great disparity in access to clean drinking water. And um, we decided that one small way that we could contribute to this was uh, addressing the privatization of water in Southern Ontario and phasing out plastic water bottles on the road and backstage. This led us to working uh, to raise awareness around the plastic water bottle issue within the music industry in general. And then that led to some fundraising and campaigning for a really great organization called Wellington Water Watchers. Um, they're based in Guelph, Ontario, and uh, they have led the charge against Nestle in the Guelph area to uh, say no to Nestle campaign. This is an incredible campaign which is seeking to phase out all water bottling permits in Ontario. Uh, thinking about plastic water bottles then led us to review waste in general, just a very simply looking at how we were waste, wasteful in our materials production and on the road. Um, we cut out shrink wrap for any item that was going to come 
straight to us to sell off stage. So all of our records and our albums, our CDs I did mention, we have a bit of an older audience, so we still sell CDs, which is great. Um, none of those come shrink wrapped anymore. It's just a small thing, but it does make it a difference. Um, we also created, uh, which I know many bands have done, a no waste rider, striking out takeout containers, requesting on site prep of food, no plastic calorie, no styrofoam, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this might seem like a very small thing, but it allowed us to have a lot of conversations with venues and promoters who hadn't even really been thinking about it. So that is a, a really positive for us. Um, and more recently, we've been thinking specifically about emissions and how to, how to offset and limit our emissions. Uh, we started a campaign uh, to plant a forest. That's called the Good Lovelies Forest. <laughs> and we, we started this in November, December 2019. And throughout that tour, we decided to plant two trees for every album, CD, or download card that we sold on that tour. Um, and in the spring of 2020, we planted 2,500 trees from that tour specifically. Um, which was definitely the best thing that happened to us in 2020. <laughs> um, we're in early conversations about revisiting this. We had a really big tour planned for 2020, which was called the Good Lovelies Forest Tour, and a portion of sales for that entire tour were going to go to planting more trees. Um, but we are, yeah, we're looking to resurrect that as soon as we can finally go on tour again. Um, and one of the most beautiful things that came out of that, I mean. I will say that planting trees doesn't address the root issue here. Like it's definitely a post emission solution. It is not the solution. But again, for us to engage our audience and talk about climate change from the stage to 60 plus uh, people who are 60 plus, some who are very aware of the issue, but it's just, it feels, um, it feels like incremental change, but it is something. Lastly, I'll just mention that we're in the early stages of creating a restoration festival. So this will be uh, held near where the Good Lovelies Forest is planted. We have some really great partners in the North Bay area who are going to help us put this festival on, hopefully. Um, so what it would be is we'd have people coming, fans and musicians, so together, working together on site to uh, do tree and native shrub planting um, and participating in ecological restoration projects on site and then at night going to see music and so the idea is just to like contextualize music with nature with climate change it, it's all related and uh, I I feel like it's such a privilege to be able to um, think about these things daily um, and yeah as I said earlier it feels incremental but it, it means a lot to me to be able to do these small things and um, yeah, it's just, it's such a privilege and a pleasure. And I, I'm, I've been trying in the last little while to really focus on the positive changes rather than dwelling in what has been done and what can't be changed, but moving forward uh, in a positive way. I'm Bridget Fry. I am one half of the band Moscow Apartment, and I am also a member of the working group for Music Declares Emergency. Although in the last month or so, most of my focus has been on um, the organization Climate Live, um, where I've helped found the Canadian chapter. So Climate Live is an international movement um, leading up to the COP um, that's supposed to be in um, Scotland in November, which is the United Nations uh, climate meeting. And basically the goal is to have countries all over the world have concerts on two days, October 24th, and I forget the exact date, but a day in November, um, and kind of just have 24 hours of concerts, both of those times um, throughout the world to kind of show how many countries care about the climate emergency and to show how many musicians care about it, um, kind of with the goal of getting those musicians' audiences to focus more on climate um, and participate more in, thank you, October 16th, um, participate more in climate action, but also to just kind of raise awareness and put pressure on governments and major corporations that have large carbon footprints and say, all these musicians care about this. And with that comes all their fans and all the people that they have influence on. Um, so yeah, that's Climate Live Canada or Climate Live. I'm part of the Canadian group. 
um, and Music Declares, many of the people um, from the Working Group on Music Declares are on the advisory committee for Climate Live Canada. The really cool thing about Climate Live Canada is most of the groundwork is done by youth. So it's a youth committee organizing and running it. And then we're lucky to have tons of talented adults and older people helping us. Um, but it's really cool because it's this international movement started and mostly done by youth across the world. Um, hey everyone, such a pleasure to be with you. I'm calling in from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territories in what's also known as Ottawa. Um, I'm really happy to be with you today because I am the executive director of Climate Action Network Canada, which for those of you who might not know, it's an umbrella organization of 130 groups working coast to coast to coast to care about how a changing climate affects people, places, and wildlife. And, um, and so we as a network are really keen to build bridges between our members and the artistic community and to figure out how to engage a kind of full society response to the climate crisis in Canada. Um, and we have hosted a couple of artists in residences at Climate Action Hour Canada. So we're really committed to, um, yeah, to making those connections and building those relationships. You know, there's a really long history of politically and environmentally engaged musicians in Canada. And um, I think the launch of Music Declares and the engagement around Climate Live is continuing that history. And it's something that we all should be really proud of. Um, and this is where the heart of a lot of our movement spaces lies, really. Um, and I wanted to share a quote with you from a previous executive director of Climate Action Network International, which is the international body that, that we are the Canadian node of. Um, I remember them saying once that, you know, we, we've been trying to get people to pay attention to the climate crisis and agree to take action at the scale that science requires. And at first we thought it was all about getting the facts to them. Like if we could just get the right scientific facts out, if people could understand them, if we could provide these briefing notes, then they'd finally make the right decision and wake up to the need to take action on this crisis. And, and so we did that and people had the right facts, but they still weren't making the right decisions. So we were like, okay, well, what do we do next? Um, we got to engage the governments. And so there was, you know, a huge effort in, in mobilizing governments and still governments are not acting with the will that's required. So maybe we need to activate people's spirits and talk to the faith community. And we've seen incredible contributions from the faith community in recent years to the climate movement and taking action on the climate crisis. And, but still we're in a place where we need to be figuring out how to reach people. And um, we've tried reaching their brains. We've tried reaching their pocketbooks. We've tried reaching their spirits. And now we have to figure out how to reach their hearts. And I think that music is the way to do that. <laughs> totally. Um, and that's why these kinds of initiatives, music and, and other art forms are the way to do that. They're the way into people's hearts, the way into people's homes. And that's really necessary because that's where the systemic change piece comes in. So um, Carolyn, like amazing initiatives that the Good Lovelies are taking and that I know so many of my music and artist friends take in their daily practices in their lives. You talked about that feeling like incremental change. And I know sometimes in the face of a crisis this large, it can feel a little demoralizing that the only change we have direct access to is incremental change. You know, buying a, an electric vehicle instead of an internal combustion engine and remembering to turn off our lights. And all of these things are important. Um, and all of the initiatives that each of you are enacting in your own world is really important. They do add up, right? And more importantly than them adding up in terms of emissions reductions, they add up as a cultural shift. And that's really important too. But I do want to tell you that if, if the objective is to get to that systemic change, what I think the power of the music industry is, is to talk to audiences. So pretty consistently, we hear that the research tells us that it's not about people hearing from experts. It's not, that's not what changes their minds. What changes people's minds is hearing from people who they see themselves in, who they somehow identify themselves with. And how do we identify ourselves more than through the music that we listen to, right? Um, and so if people are, are able to hear directly from the musicians that they, are love, that they love, who, they, who help to define their identity, 
then that opens the door that can potentially open the door to them feeling a lot more comfortable caring and talking about climate change. Because we are in a space where a lot of people feel uncomfortable talking about it. It feels like it's political or people are like, I don't know enough about climate change to talk about it. But if we're not talking about it, if we're not going to our elected officials of any political stripe to say, hey, I care about this issue. I am willing to talk openly about the fact that I care about this issue. I'm gonna tell my neighbors, my family, my friends that I care about climate change and I expect you to take action on it. And it's not until we get to that point where everyone feels that comfort level that governments are gonna feel the pressure to take that action. And so I would just really encourage all of you to understand that your role in that systemic transformation is actually standing on stage telling, your, telling people who love you <laughs> that you care about this issue and inviting them to do the same. Um, so here we are, we're on the heels of the COVID-19 crisis, there are a multitude of like intersecting tragedies and crises that have emerged over the course of the last year. Climate crisis hasn't gone anywhere. And I know that, um, you know, the music industry is facing some pretty intense challenges, particularly with the venue crunch. Um, I'm like desperate for the next time that I'm able to see a show or go dancing and uh, and I'm worried about what it's going to look like when when that's once again available to us, but we no longer have the spaces um, that we can do those things in. I want to tell you about this movement we've been involved in in the last few years, um, or in the last year, I should say, called the Just Movement for a Just Recovery, because this is a space where this cross sectoral approach, this bringing everyone together to figure out how we can use this moment of disruption um, to build back better really to like figure out how to plan a different world and it's also a moment that's shown us how deeply interconnected everything is and how it's brought us into confrontation with existing um, weaknesses and injustices built into our social and economic system so i also want to encourage all of us to understand that these crises are interlinked and as we move forward and are thinking about taking action on climate change and building back our, our community spaces that we can actually be using this moment to do those things simultaneously. And fortunately, right now, at least for the time being, um, the Minister of Heritage of Canada, Stephen Guibault, is a former climate activist. And so he really marries these two objectives as well. And I think that's an incredible opportunity. So what are our priorities? I'll leave it on that. Right now, we're really focused on trying to get Canada to pass um, the first piece of climate accountability legislation that's ever been tabled by a sitting government. Uh, it's pretty high stakes. Um, that bill was introduced over 112 days ago and it hasn't passed second reading yet. It's being really delayed. And so we are calling on all parties to work together to get that bill passed second reading because we need a piece of climate legislation in this country. <laughs> It's been too long and we've missed every climate target we've ever set in part because we don't have a framework for meeting those targets. Um, and then we have to push Canada to deliver a whole lot more ambition. We are the only OECD country. So we are one of, we are the only one of 32 wealthy nations on this planet whose emissions have gone up in the last five years instead of declining. Um, so we need to be bringing a whole lot more work to the table. And part of that includes being brave enough to have a real conversation about the future of our oil and gas industry in this country, um, because that is the greatest and largest source of emissions in Canada and consistently a topic that we don't address. And then finally, and this is a place where, again, I think artists have a big role to play. We need to collectively figure out how to move climate change from being from from being a partisan issue in this country where and I think that's that's where we're at right now, unfortunately. Um, and climate change, while it might sometimes be political, is nonpartisan. And I think that's a message that, that all of us need to be delivering um, to our audiences. The, one of the things I think there's the most work to do on is kind of the root of the root here. So, I mean, the climate emergency has to be at the center of conversations about how we're moving forward post pandemic, but we can't have that conversation without addressing the environmental racism that is embedded within that and it has been for far too long which Caroline I'm glad that you touched on that before too so 
as a climate focused mu music organization, we really want to prioritize listening to the voices of black and indigenous people and people of color in our community. Uh, and we also recognize that there's not a lot of diversity uh, in those speaking today or on the working group. So this is something we're really actively wanting to work on. So I'm, I'm a white passing person of mixed ethnicity. And so um, doing what I can to help the Canadian climate movement look more like the communities that it works in and with is a big priority for me. And a couple of things um, that I've been trying to live and um, hold in, the, in our community as we've done that is like actually having dis concrete policies about participation from BIPOC people and, um, and also women, although yeah, a different world, but it also can sometimes be a, a, the case in our world that we wind up with like all white male panels still. And, you know, and so we, we also have some, um, some concrete like commitments to having women represented. So, you know, so we like, and several of our members have um, made it a decision that we will no longer appear on all white panels. Um, we've made really concrete decisions around who we hire. We have uh, also dedicated a portion of one of our staff members time to providing um, direct service and, and support to BIPOC community organizers and organizations. And then we have tried to figure out how to host those kinds of conversations in our community and the just recovery space that I mentioned earlier has been a big place for that. So part of what we hosted there that I can um, add a link to in the chat is a conversation about how uh, just recovery and climate action um, and anti-racism efforts are inherently intertwined because we sometimes in the climate movement, we get pushback against that. Like, oh, we can't care about racism because it's, it's a problem, but like we're too busy caring about climate change and we don't want to get distracted. <laughs> and fundamentally, the fight against the climate crisis is the same fight as the fight against systemic racism and colonial practices of extraction of like natural resource and cultural extraction. Those are all the same battles because those are all the same systems of oppression, of extractivism um, that that lead to all of those those crises. So thinking about it at, at that systems level and, and fostering those conversations in really compassionate and bold ways has been really helpful for us. And one, um, two, two axioms that I bring to it that I may offer you guys is number one, uh, a quote from um, a facilitator I love, Adrian Marie Brown, and she says, uh, acknowledge intent, but attend to impact. And we sometimes hide behind good intentions. Like we didn't mean to cause this harm, so we don't take responsibility for it. Um, but the fact is, if you cause harm, it's necessary to take that responsibility in order to come back to that relationship of trust. Um, and the second is uh, move at the speed of trust, which is a quote that um, I don't think she originated it, but I hear the executive director of Indigenous Climate Action, Ariel Durange, say it a lot. Um, and that's, I think, a really important one, too, because it's, again, about relationship and trust building, and that takes time. I, I love, Catherine, that you referenced Adrienne Mary Brown. She's uh, such a great person to read when you're doing activism. She's always talking about getting the joy out of it, and it's really important. Great quote there. Um, I think one of the things that we need to recognise in the music industry and working in this space in the music industry is that the industry and who's been successful in it and who is high up in it is very skewed towards white maleness. Um, so when we're platforming artists and we're sharing artists' actions, you might be Tom York or you might be an up-and-coming black feminist band, you get the same platform. It's not because you've got a million followers, you're more important than someone who's got 250 followers. It's about really sort of recognizing that success in music doesn't mean that you're more important than someone who's not successful in music. Obviously, those artists with a big reach, we have to work with those artists because it's, it's important to reach a lot of people. But I think leveling that platform with, with what we're doing is really important because it, it 
it doesn't play into that already skewed industry. And sometimes, I mean, I usually tend to the socials and social media and we have, we just have to not post stuff because we have all of this content for people sharing their shirts and it's, it's a lot of the same people and it's just sort of, you have to address that balance um, in any way that you can. In our working group, I, it's, it's something that I wish we'd done from the very, very, very start is making sure that we're a diverse working group. It happened so quickly that whoever was in the room became the working group and then you have to undo that. And so it's, I would say it's really important to get that in from the beginning um, to anyone starting up a group. It's, um, but I mean, we've, we've got a lot of nice mix now, so it's good, but it, it does take some little bit of undoing and going back into things to make that balance happen. So um, yeah, that's a, definitely a learning for us. So we know we've got a lot of work to do in Canada to rebuild with sustainability. Uh, what are some ways that you feel like the music industry in Canada should transform in this time, in this pivotal moment? I've been thinking a lot about funding. We're really lucky in Canada that we have these great funding bodies. Um, I mean, we could have a conversation about how they award funding, but, you know, folks like uh, Factor, Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council, like a lot of us have benefited, if not survived as musicians through these programs. So I'd be curious if we could um, create some funding opportunities that focus on greening projects uh, for bands. I think that it's really prohibitive. Sometimes I'm... Um, not speaking for my own band, we made a decision really early on to source like as sustainable materials for our merchandise as possible. This, by the way, is going to be one of our working groups. So if you're interested in this topic, please get in touch with us. But sourcing, you know, sustainable materials for our for our merchandise, um, less less damaging uh, uh, records, LPs. Um, but it is prohibitive for a lot of young bands in order to make these sustainably. Um, sourced uh, t-shirts, for example, like the right kind of cotton, um, also ethical materials. So I'd be really interested in seeing if we could get some funding on side um, for these kind of projects. And that's such a little thing, but I do think it would help a lot of people whose bands are, let, let's be honest, are going to come out of this, <laughs> maybe not being able to make a choice to make t-shirts, you know, that aren't, you know, sweatshop made. So um, yeah, it's just one thought I had is, is around the funding programs. That's a great one. Yeah, being able to fund uh, choice, basically, being able to allow for that. And it's, it's really unfortunate that there's often a, a premium, whether it's for, because a product is very marketable or just because there's more labor involved in processing it or, or something. It's, it can be not accessible for everybody. So I agree that would be a great, great thing to do for artists. So, I mean, I am fairly new to the music industry. Uh, you know, being 18, I've only been playing regularly for a few years, but uh, as part of Music Declares Emergency and as someone whose mom was a climate activist for a really long time, um, something we've been talking about is the idea of, which I know has already been brought up a couple of times um, during this, but building back better because the music industry is going to have to be rebuilt following this. Like it's been hit so hard. And so while we have that opportunity, finding every way we can to feasibly build back so it supports artists, but is also sustainable. And and it's it's a tricky question to just come up with answers for off the top of your head because it's such a big, big, you know, task to take on, but like something that we've been talking about is the impact of not just musicians touring, but people coming to the shows, you know, if like, if someone has a show in a town and people drive all the way, like, like, you know, if, if, if an artist you love is playing like a two hour drive away, you're, you're going to go see that. And that's, has a carbon footprint. And, um, thinking of ways to kind of make that more sustainable. So have, having buses maybe go from different towns into shows, which not only is more sustainable, but then also can help with that feeling of live music and having that sense of community that I think we're all really lacking um, 
with, you know, while we're not having live music. And so just trying to come up with innovative things like that. Um, so yeah, organizing carpooling and, and even small things like, I mean, I've been thinking about like how many shows I've gone to that use confetti, um, <laughs> which is a thing like the, cause you, when you go to a big stadium show, there's confetti, which does not break down most of the time. And I saw an article about, um, biodegradable confetti made from like flour. So like, there's just so many things that people can start. I think when we have to rebuild the music industry, just finding every way we can to kind of make things more sustainable while also kind of breathing new life into the music industry. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, it actually reminds me of something I found on the ACT website, uh, which is kind of a rejigging of the um, three R's rule. It, it doesn't sound as zippy, it's the three N F E rule, but it applies specifically to uh, the music industry and the choices, considering these and the choices that we make. So the first N is naked. So like what, uh, I forget who mentioned, oh, I think it was Caroline about lack, uh, not having the shrink wrap around stuff, so no packaging if possible. Not far is the next one, which is what you're touching on, Bridget. Natural, so natural organic fibers, etc. Fair, fair trade, fair work, fair pay. And is it actually essential? That's the last thing that they mentioned. Do you really need to have that item? I, I just I actually just had this brainwave of something I forgot to mention earlier is that in the lead up to this uh, Good Lovelies Forest, this relates, I promise, uh, Good Lovelies Forest tour, um, we had made deals with several promoters um, who were going to actually offset the show for us. It was part of the contract. And this was the first time we were, we had put this into the contract. So there was a, a deal made with the local promoter to, um, to plant so many trees and they were gonna engage their audiences to do it. So I love that idea of like putting it on the promoter, like don't make you, this band plant a hundred trees cause they have to go to Thunder Bay. You know what I mean? make the make the promoter take it on with their community and then the conversation around it changes it becomes the community's responsibility instead of always dumping it on the artist it's just it's something i've been thinking about a lot anyways i'm sorry i just jumped in there but I, it felt like it was related to this this uh this not far thing is that the music industry is ready for this there's a lot of people wanted this to happen and they wanted someone to step in and start doing it they, you're right, there's all of this amazing stuff happening already. Um, Julie's Bicycle, who we're partnered with, have been going since, um, I think they've been going for 13 years. And they launched after Live Earth, and they saw this big climate concert take place. And they thought, okay, but everyone flew in, and like, the infrastructure was all wrong, and this isn't doing anything. We need to actually get into the nuts and bolts and get into the industry and make changes, those incremental changes that Caroline mentioned all the way through the industry. So they've been plugging away, they have so much knowledge. So we've been really lucky to partner with them. And I'm sure there will be similar organizations in Canada, whether they've been going for as long or just starting up with lots of people are thinking about the same kind of thing at the moment. And within the music industry, again, people are very, very keen. There's a lot of action taking place, but people are busy so they need someone or an organization to keep moving things along to keep saying look these people over here are doing this you can follow this thing you don't have to reinvent the wheel this is already happening so that coordination is really an important part of what we're doing and, and making those connections at some point we joked that we should have a dating app that sort of just put people in touch with each other but um maybe in the next few years but um so that's been a big learning, really, that the industry is ready. Musicians are ready. Musicians are anxious about this. They've been worrying for a long time about their carbon footprints, but are worried about speaking out because of not wanting to go out on a limb, not wanting to be a hypocrite, let alone be called out on being a hypocrite. So it's all about that moving together, moving as an industry, recognizing the systemic nature of the issues, and it's not anybody's individual fault. And working towards sort of combating those systemic issues really um but together as an industry so yeah the 
all of those amazing coincidences and serendipitous moments have probably come from the fact that this is an, an overdue mo mo uh, movement in a way. It's the world is ready for this.